like I just got a thought this morning I had a wart on my cranium and by applying iodine to it uh, the wart has gone away and I've decided that a wart which is a virus is I decided that cancer inside of you is like a wart another virus and if we could only get inside of it and treat it the way we can a wart outside and get rid of it and uh, what else is in the joy book well you write down your list of things to do when you wake up in the morning and spend your alone time with God the first thing in the morning then you find out what you have to do and you list it and then you check it off and every 15 minutes you rejoice and I have a record of it every 15 minutes rejoice about something and your meditation is here and your pure thoughts are here a joy book is a really good idea will that help you? I hope so I want you to make it what do I mean by making it? being 100% happy I know it's there for you and I know it's waiting for you I keep trying to hold your hand and take you to it but having a joy book is a really good idea hey that was a big day what was that for? the work up to date and alone and empty that means you're alone with God and empty means there's nothing on your to-do list you've done it all my goodness that hasn't happened for a long time what day was that? November 27th oh yes it was around the holiday Thanksgiving that is a good time to get your work up to date what's this happy face for? oh I found something that I thought I'd lost something of great value so I do recommend you get a you get a, a joy book and I like the ones with the hard covers because you're carrying it around and it makes it easier to write in and it makes your handwriting more legible here's some Christmas carols for you on December the 13th first Noel we three kings of Orientar oh this is an Easter hymn, well oh, this is a good one when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died my richest gain I count as loss and poor contempt on all my pride that is a creature that is a furry creature it is a Felix Domestica a domesticated feline and the student asked the professor is it hard to become a professor? and the professor says oh no you do it by degrees and the boy said my mother took me to the cemetery and the teacher said oh I'm sorry somebody did and he says yeah they all were uh, <laughs> we hope so <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> it's for you okay yes thank you for your patience oh you're welcome one moment this man was well behaved and this woman asked him how come and he says it's my father when I was a boy every time I was well behaved he gave me a penny and a pat on the head and by the time I was 18 I had twenty dollars and a flat head <laughs> you are too much woman uh, the uh, man was asked why are you so well behaved and he said it's my father when I was a boy and I was well behaved my father would pat me on the head and give me a penny and by the time I was 18 years old I had twenty dollars and a flat head <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, okay. Did I tell you about the owner of the store? 
And he said to the employee, I heard you arguing with a customer. No. And uh, he says, I want you to know that the policy of this store is the customer is always right. And I never want to hear you argue with, with the customer again. Do you understand that? Uh-huh. And the employee says, yes, sir. Uh-huh. And, and the owner says, well, what were you arguing about? And the employee said, he said you were an idiot. <laughs> Oh, well, yep, you never know. you got to give all the details, right? Let's see. What did I tell you last? Uh, uh, did I tell you about the boy studying his uh, ancient history, and he said to his father, what's a Grecian urn? And his father said about seven fifty an hour. <laughs> What you doing today, folks? The uh, Sony Mini DV camcorder is worn out. It will take its beautiful picture. It continues to do that. But it will not play back and it will not rewind. So my neighbor loaned me her Panasonic, which is three times the price of this Sony Mini DV. And what's in progress now is the seventh edition. The seventh edition out of 14. And um, so how many tapes have been used up? This is the first run. These are all quads. There's four uh, shows on each tape, so there's 20 shows. This is getting ready for the third run. This is the second run over here, the one that's going on now. But uh, so we've used up a pile of tapes already. But I wanted to show you this is the largest accumulation of uh, tapes to come back from the TV stations that we've ever had. And Dennis was so nice, he brought all this mail over. Look at this. These are all tapes returned by my TV stations. Aren't they nice? Aren't they nice to do that? Look at that. How many boxes, folks? One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's a big one. Seven. Eight, nine? Is that what you got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And these two boxes have already been unloaded, plus a, a bag, plus there's a box on the bed that's being worked on. Thank you, TV stations. Yeah, this is the one on the bed I didn't show you. That's chock full. That's from White Plains. Thank you, Jim Kenny. You're certainly a pleasure to deal with. Say it again. Say it again. Say roof. 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 Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, you cute little teddy bear. Yeah, you cute little teddy bear. Uh, <laughs> 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 What's your name? Snowball. Oh, Snowball. Yeah. <laughs> this is a shoe. It's a high heel. It's for a dog. And it's got a dog bone and a. Sh oh, that's yeah. That's just what Lauren needs. For, the, for Foxy. Yeah, it's Wouldn't like that, a nice Foxy stuff. For five it? bucks? Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to come back. You want to get it now? Okay. Yeah, do you. I'd get it now. Yeah, hang on a minute. Okay. Fantastic. Isn't that fantastic? That's for the doggy? Yes. There it has go. a dog bone and a toothbrush. Thank you very much. A toothbrush. And a toothbrush. Can you put that right in the car? Yes. Goodbye, Snowball. Goodbye. No. Yeah, goodbye. Oh, <laughs> you put your little hands together. That's so cute. I don't know if I can do it. I'd have to find something. Is it all on Main Street, or is some of it up at the uh, kiosk, or whatever no, you call it? I think everything is on Main Street, all the way down to the, the little railroad. See, all these places would be open. 
Oh, not nice. Hello. Hey, how you doing? How are you? They must be serving food later. We're trying. Oh, what are you going to be serving? Popcorn. Popcorn. Kettle corn, actually. Huh? And what's the difference? Um, you'd have to combine taste it. Oh, okay. Combine <laughs> taste it. Combine taste it. All right. We'll give you a sample. All righty. <laughs> Some people live down there. They live way down in that hole. And people live right up to the sidewalk. See that? See, that's the end of the house, and there's the sidewalk. Their windows are right on the sidewalk. Valencia, New York. Down here somewhere is the Kinderhook Creek. That empties into the Hudson and it also makes the Stuyvesant Falls. Are you having a good time, folks? She's not going to open until a quarter of, so that means it gives us six minutes or so. Okay. Yeah, we can wait. This is Le Chardin. Yeah. And the ones across the street. Great finds. Ooh, you can walk over there and see what you can find. Okay. Look at all the cookies. You, want to go you made all the no, cookies. I'll rest. I'm not interested in one of the Okay. Yeah, you, 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 you sit. I'll be back, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, you come with us, Elizabeth. No, she wants to sit. She needs. She's going to be performing. Did, so. did you make all these uh, yes, cookies? Yes, I did that this morning. Wow. Yeah. Tell me what they are. Oh, well, they're just a small cake with a little frosting. Oh, it's yeah. a little cake. Yep. And they're all the same thing, they're little cake. They're all the same thing. Yep. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, nativity scene there. That's Le Jardin. Hi there. Oh, doesn't it smell nice in here? It smells <laughs> nice. I, I smell really good. <laughs> it smells nice and it looks nice. That's me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a hog for confidence. <laughs> I'm a hog for confidence. I'll take any confidence. <laughs> Sir, thank you so much. Have a nice That's evening. Pretty. That's glass, I think. Does that look all right? French dark chocolate. Let's see if there's okay. any milk in it. We're going to have some music soon. Oh, actually, Abby's going to be here just in a minute. So. Is there any milk in the chocolate? She can't have milk. Oh. Oh, she can have milk. Some dark chocolate has no milk. Really? Oh, yeah. If you have... <laughs> hmm. That is... You know, my husband cannot have eggs. She can't have egg I either. Can't have eggs. You can't have eggs either? Yeah, I can't have and eggs. Can't and have my cheese. daughter can't have milk. I have but never see, met another But see, dark person. chocolate... Dark chocolate has no milk. It's oh, processed okay. on machines that may have milk, eggs, 
tree nuts. Wheat, peanuts, and soybeans. Oh, I like this. Book but there's, how, how there's no milk. You have to be. Like, will you get really sick if you have it? Eggs. Mm. Um, it bothers my nerves. Oh. You know, well, it, it tightens your back. Tight, it tightens the nerves in my back, and my, the muscles How in my unusual. back start then she goes tightening. Out of whack. She's then I go out of whack, and yeah. then I. Ha You're not filming this, are you? In <laughs> Tim, <laughs> never once have I slipped a little bit of egg in there. Yeah. yeah. How much are your help. dark chocolates? All the candy bars are five dollars and fifty cents. We've got dark chocolate, the same company who does the Santa Pops. These are two dollars. Mm -hmm. And then these are fabulous. I don't know if any of these would work for you, but these are awesome. Well, later I'll bring my daughter over. She's playing at the, um... Oh, great. Um, Maud's place here. Right, Maud's no, place. The music school. So I want to uh, treat her as, as long as that is dark chocolate. Well, before... She, you why know? don't you read before you come... Because, like, this one would be milk chocolate. Yep, now this one, I just can't see the ingredients because... I can't either. <laughs> oh, I can't either. It's gold on nothing. There you go. Milk. <laughs> what are those? Those are Christmas balls. Oh, and the, the white ones are too? They're glass. Yeah. Glass. Mm. Yeah, we should find out where yeah. we're this is this is a map vesta for you. Just local? A local map? Local map. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can take that home. All right. Well, thank you. This will tell you where what's happening on the street. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks for stopping. I think they're coming back. We will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This is Route 203, folks. It goes to Chatham. Hi, Gretchen. How are you? Good. I gave you $20. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Mary wants you to sign a receipt. I did, and I gave I gave the receipt back to her. Oh, okay. She's got it somewhere. I don't know what she's done with it. I saw the receipt, but I didn't see it signed. But you did sign it, huh? I did sign it. Yes, I did. And I'm just about putting your concert. I saw you on the TV. You saw me on TV? Just about 20 minutes ago. I was editing my Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're quite right. Hi, sweetie. Hi, lady. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. I good. guess you're the video person tonight, huh? <laughs> <laughs>
bit about us. We offer lessons in piano, voice, violin, guitar, now cello. Um, sometimes composition. Sometimes composition. We are also going to be holding a composers for a Monday night at um, the First Reformed Church in Chatham. So you're all welcome to attend that. We should have composed pieces of music, and they are going to get to see their pieces performed and sit back and enjoy that. So. Anyway, we're going to get started tonight. Um, we're going to begin with Elizabeth Kelser, and Elizabeth is going to be playing Carol of the Bells and Angels We Have Heard Tonight.
since the time of one of Charles Cutting's greatest giants, Pablo Casals, this arrangement of the adagio from originally the organ toccata has been a great favorite of cellists. And we are particularly honored tonight because a very distinguished organist, Michael de Benedictus, has agreed to accompany an arrangement for cello. <laughs> <laughs>
about the fans, our favorite aria. It's very brief. From Donizetti's Le Vesir d'Amor. <laughs> <laughs> He's an artist. What do you want?
Now these are the people uh, who are the fiduciaries. And now bankers, two things against Bankers Trust. There's no such company as Bankers Trust Company of New York. And that's one thing. And then Bankers Trust Company turns out to be a felon. And a felon cannot be a fiduciary. Oh, look at that sunset over there. Can you see it? So that's one thing, and they are keeping her money away from her. The surrogate court is doing nothing to help her, and you can suspect that the surrogate court is getting some of the money that Susan should be getting. So these are the documents that I just wanted you to see. Criminal docket for case number three, USA versus Bankers Trust. They are a convicted felon. How can they be a fiduciary? And they are keeping Susan from her money. State of New York Banking Department. And this is about Bankers Trust. Look how quickly that sunset disappeared. Bye, folks. This is the end of the three-week reports. A chat with Glendora. www.achatwithglendora.com. Pray for Suzanne Hayward. I mean, pray for Suzanne McCormick. What are the names? Uh, Tom Elderly is on the right, and then Zach DC, and then Hannah Green, and uh, I don't know who goes in. Now we're going to the old railroad station. This is Valencia, New York, Columbia County.
on Main Street. Dad, there's only... Jars oh. with the appropriate oh. thing you want to try to win. Oh. to Dorothy. Yeah. Oh, it's not nice that you donated it. Well, that, that, there's that one and another one, and then there's a big kind of a bus thing. That, so there must be a lot of people. Oh, well, uh, did you loan the tractor too? No. No, uh -huh. not ours. It is a necessary, logical, and natural extension to our discussion of applications to include the almost inevitable role the military assumes within them. Indeed, the dichotomy of extreme, sustained, and continuous interest and monitoring of the aerosol research by the military and intelligence complex juxtaposed with the public declaration by the U.S. Air Force that this entire subject is a hoax is curious enough that many of us may wish to seek the truth of the matter. The most advanced military agencies, intelligence services, and defense contractors clearly have an interest in monitoring and controlling the level of discussion and disclosure on the aerosol issue. The tools of research and analysis must therefore be used at least in part to compensate for the lack of openness that now shrouds this democracy under the guise of national security. A glimpse into the military window has been achieved and a central theme will eventually emerge, and that is of control. Control in the deepest and far-reaching sense that you may imagine. For when the atmosphere of the planet is controlled, 
life itself in the end is controlled. With a basic knowledge of plasma physics, that is, the physics of an energized gas or atmosphere, it is impossible to proceed further without at least a brief introduction to the HARP facility and technology. HARP, or High Active Auroral Research Program, is operated by the U.S. Air Force and is claimed to be simply a research facility. The stated purpose by the Air Force for the HARP project is that of a scientific endeavor aimed at studying the properties and behavior of the ionosphere, with particular emphasis on being able to understand and use it to enhance communications and surveillance systems for both civilian and defense purposes. It may be this, and then again, it may be more than simply a scientific endeavor. It may also be enlightening to consider United States Patent 4686-605 by Bernard Eastland in 1987 entitled, A Method and Apparatus for Altering a Region in the Earth's Atmosphere, Ionosphere, and or Magnetosphere. There are many who have sensibly concluded that this patent essentially represents a blueprint for the HARP facility as it has been constructed. This patent makes mention of numerous objectives and methods of operation that far exceed any scientific endeavor alone and references the work of Nikola Tesla as a source of historical contribution. The amazing inventions and achievements of Tesla with respect to energy transfer and amplification, including the use of the atmosphere as a medium for sending energy from point A to point B, are well documented. The documents of Tesla were eventually confiscated at the close of his life, especially as they related to military matters, and he is generally now accepted as an unrecognized genius. The current incarnation of ionospheric heating is able to, according to Mr. Eastland, put unprecedented amounts of power in the Earth's atmosphere at strategic locations, and to maintain that power level with the pulsing of energy. This patent also recommends the use of large clouds of barium so that ionization by sunlight will increase the electron density within the plasma environment. Testing and analysis does now positively indicate the presence of unusual levels of barium, a toxic element, within atmospheric samples. The amount of power inherent in the design of the HARP project is further indicated by Mr. Eastland stating that the present invention can be formed to simulate or perform the same functions as a detonation of a heave type nuclear device without actually having to detonate such a device. A heave weapon has the effect of lifting the magnetic field of the earth itself and involves the expenditure of massive amounts of energy. The patent is further stated to have numerous military implications, including the enhancement of or interference with communication and guidance systems, including those of airplanes and missiles, radar interference, missile destruction, weather modification, material transport of micron-sized particles, and molecular change of the atmosphere are each mentioned as further applications of the patent design. The executive summary for the HARP project also specifically mentions forcing the descent of particles from the atmosphere toward the ground using ELF radiation from HARP. Clearly, environmental modifications, the electromagnetic transfer of energy, and military operations of global impact are already in sight from the existence of these aerosols within our atmosphere. In 1977, the United States Senate held hearings on the subject of biological testing by the Department of Defense on human subjects without their informed consent. In the opening statement, Senator Kennedy identifies the key issue of the hearings, the known use of Americans as unwitting human subjects for open-air germ warfare testing conducted in the public domain by officials of our own government. Furthermore, he poses the critical question, should a democratic people cede to its government the full responsibility of determining when secret tests on unwitting subjects are necessary to protect the nation's security? It appears that this key issue was never truly addressed, and that almost 30 years later, this responsibility is no longer a question that is even being posed to the public. 
It is a fact, however unpleasant and distressing the consideration may be, that biological components have been repeatedly identified in a series of tests of atmospheric samples over a period of several years. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has refused to identify physical material that has been demonstrated to contain biologicals of this same form. These components appear to involve the use of desiccation, freeze-drying, and aerosol distribution methods, exactly the same methods itemized within the private contractor listings of the Senate hearings. Evidence further indicates that extremely advanced biotechnical methods are likely to be a part of the development and delivery process. To date, no professional or public medical professionals have attempted to duplicate the test methods and results, and the evidence continues to be provided only through independent citizen activism. Acknowledgement and response to this evidence by all public officials remains lacking. There is currently no prospect of government hearings on the aerosol issue, and the reality of the evidence continues to be denied by public officials. And lastly, although more conceptual in nature than our earlier discussion on environmental modification, electromagnetic, military, and biological aspects of the aerosol issue, it is not unreasonable to consider interactions with the Earth as a whole. It is not impossible that there may be connections between the energy levels of this altered plasma of the Earth and geophysical processes, including Earth changes. There has been increased attention in recent months by prestigious scientific organizations, mainstream media, and the Defense Department itself on dramatic Earth changes that are foreseen in the not-too-distant future. These discussions center on major climatic change and geophysical field changes, such as the magnetic field. Under disclosure is the likelihood that these changes occur much more rapidly than was previously supposed. It is at least a theoretical reality that a plasma sheath around the Earth can accumulate energy. This originates from the combination of increased electron density and low frequency energy propagation. There are many questions that can be asked as to how and if this energy can be harnessed to affect the Earth. The many abnormal Earth changes already on the record during the recent years certainly offer a motive for examining the energy transfer between the Earth and the now altered atmosphere. You have seen traces of a world still in a state of beauty, and you have seen the signs of a terrible change. It will be for you to decide if the claims of this documentary are true or not. You have seen the distinctions between what mankind has known for decades to be in harmony with our surroundings and that which is a product of our urge for technological supremacy over nature. You have seen a clear sky, this blue that was but is no more the sky that has been taken away from us all. You have been confronted with assertions of operations on a scale never seen before in the history of mankind. And you have been shown evidence that aircraft can alter and have altered the fragile envelope for life that we call the atmosphere. You have seen science and sampling applied to the problem over and over at the grassroots level. Numerous methods have been demonstrated that show artificial and deliberate modification of the atmosphere, including its chemical, thermal, electromagnetic, and physical properties. There are detrimental effects that can be anticipated and that have been observed as a result of these changes in our air, and we must all accept the consequences of the toxic environment that has been created. The health of our home and lives have been sacrificed in the search for dominion and control. You have witnessed a high level of interest in the subject of this documentary by the military branches at the highest level, the intelligence services, the chemical industry, research organizations, defense contractors, bioengineering firms, and the pharmaceutical complex. You have heard the responses of the public, government, and even environmental organizations in response to the innumerable requests by the public for investigation. 
These responses repeatedly revert to describing phenomena that are normal and commonly observed while denying and dismissing the extraordinary observations that sensible and reasonable citizens have called attention to. There has been a sustained campaign to ridicule and discredit the cumulative efforts of years of research, activism, and devotion by countless individuals acting from the motive of concern for the health of this planet and its inhabitants. A free and democratic society, if it is to continue to exist, must be able to openly discuss the benefits of technological and military supremacy against the deleterious impact upon the environment that we as global citizens must share. Divine rights of humankind must assume their rightful place amongst the individual nation's right for military security and secrecy. You have heard the responses of only a few citizens and professionals who state their sensible concerns about the impact of the aerosol operations upon our environment and our health. The lack of time prevents the presentation of the awareness that is now known to be shared by a grassroots network that conservatively must include millions of people. The extent of this awareness across national boundaries is apparent, and this network is of global proportion. The control of media information by relatively few corporate interests appears to be a significant factor in the restriction of honest and open public discourse on the aerosol issue. The attempts at ridicule of this issue by the U.S. military establishment should also be evaluated as to intent and motive. You have been provided with an analysis of the potential agendas of the aerosol operations, the conduct of environmental, military, electromagnetic, biological and geophysical operations are each consistent with the vast body of information and evidence that has been accumulated over a period of more than five years. This result has been reached with the painstaking efforts of numerous citizens, researchers and activists across the country and around the globe. Many of the operations under consideration would appear to regard the welfare of human beings, the life of this planet and our environment as a low priority. Many people Having become convinced of the reality of these operations, we'll naturally ask the question, what can I do to help? It is also known from experience in history that many of these same individuals feel helpless and powerless after they confront the immensity and complexity of the operations. They also often become disillusioned after encountering the predictable and disingenuous responses of our public servants. It is also known that the traditional methods of dissent and activism are no longer working, and the political process is failing in a constitutional sense. Petitions have been signed and disregarded. Appeals for investigation are dismissed. Calls for media involvement lead to crafted articles of ridicule. Even the legitimacy of the voting process itself is in question. There is no comfortable, reassuring, and simple answer that can be given to you. This is the reality that we must face. It is expected that any success will eventually result from an enormous groundswell of grassroots activism and open public protest. At the current rate of progress, a timeline of decades can be projected before we reach the level of influence that is needed. The sober counter-reality is that the health of this planet is not likely to give us such a generous allowance of time. Our atmosphere is our lifeblood, and like the proverbial frog in the warming pot of water, we are acting obliviously to our own demise. You will have to use your talents and resources, your gift of life, to help this planet. The role of this researcher has been to give you the best information of what is believed to be the true nature of the aerosol operations. You will have to determine your role and exercise that role while you still have the opportunity to do so. If you are a professional, you must inquire into the ethics of your profession and answer the questions of public service that accompany it. If you are a citizen, you must participate. If you remain silent in the hope of preserving your freedom and security, you are almost certain to lose both. The doctor, the journalist, the scientist, the lawyer, the politician, the environmentalist, the activist, the author, the filmmaker, the fundraiser, the organizer, you must all assume your roles openly, publicly, and quickly to offer any real hope for our survival. I make this appeal to you. This documentary is a not-for-profit venture. It has been made with an appeal to you personally in mind. 
It may be freely copied in its entirety and distributed. No individual is permitted to distribute this documentary with a profit motive. It has been created for the benefit of the public. Please help us to restore and regain the world that you know can exist. So folks, we ran out of tape. And we continue exposing the truth as covered up by Bruce Golding, Gannett Newspapers, and by Saturday Stevens, Burke and Burke, Park Avenue, Liar for Hire. as to the obituary of Robert M. Kelly. Before, we're on page 22, and this is over at page 30, so. And I'm going to show you the hours and dollars that the lying of this model lawyer, oh, he's a model lawyer, because he lies. I'm going to show you the hours and dollars that Callagy's lying cost just myself and think of all the others. Upsilon, Glendora reminds you again that public access is the last garrison of free speech. You print only what the international bankers want you to print. Who are the international bankers? They're the people that I sued. Or I sued ten of them. Rothschild, Lazar Frere, Warburg Pincus, David Rockefeller, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, the Federal Reserve System, Alan Greenspan, the World Bank, the Trilateral Commission, and the Council on Foreign Relations. You print only what they let you print. And you read only, folks, or hear what you, what they want you to hear. I would boycott them if I did. I don't listen to the television news. I do not read newspapers. I would much rather spend my time reading good. 
doing good. Working with you. I won't give them a moment of my time. And time for Caligi is gone. Robert M. Callaghy leaves a memorial of this. He kidnapped the truth. He abducted the truth. In one hand and justice in the other. In a monumental legal paper, Glendora wrote Memorial Day this year. She asked, quote, what memorial would Caligi leave? How prophetic it turned out to be. From May, the fifth month, to November, the 11th, a half a year. Following the question was a prayer that he find his oneness with God. That's what I wanted, was his happiness. Well, did he? The legacy you got paid to force on the people, Bruce Golding, Gannett, is all conclusory. No facts, no law. It testifies to no power to perform. Physical, spiritual, intellectual, moral, legal, no power to perform. It's gone. You've lost it. Yours is abhorrently and, quote, inside job, unquote. That's what this obituary is in a public newspaper. It is a nadir of newspapering and in broad daylight getting broader in one week the winter solstice. In addition to in addition to wait a second for something about forty or so lawsuits against the law breaking public access laws. Okay, let me patch it up here. In addition to dying, owing Glendora $110, well actually it was only 100 because Bryant made him pay the 10. Uh, plus 9% statutory interest since 1995, Caligi died owing Glendora the 9% statutory interest, 1995, on $350 that Glendora sent to Charles F. Dolan, the chairman of Cablevision, and to James L. Dolan, his son, the chief executive officer, and to three other of his hoods to appear as witnesses to be examined in the United States Federal Court Caligi did not pay Glendora the interest on that $350 for eight years. That's complicated. The sentence is too long. Do you like judges who have sentences who are too long? Let me go back over it. Okay. He requested the uh, discovery of the audio tape where Cablevision violated forbidden cable operator editorial control over public access. Now, when I sued Cablevision for taking a chat with Glendora off of TV in Nassau County in 1993, uh, 
the litigation went on and on and on, and it was Callagy who made it go on and on and who obstructed justice. Uh, finally, we got to the trial. And Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 54, says uh, that if you summon somebody to come to trial as a witness, you have to pay them $70 a day, I think it was, or $40 a day, and then you have to pay them travel. So the travel would be for Charles Dolan to come from Nassau County to Westchester County and all of his hired hoods to come with him. And so that amounted to $350. And so Franklin paid that $350 to Cablevision. When Brian, as crookedly as anybody could, fixed things and canceled the justice of the trial, instead of returning that money, Charles Dolan people, put the money in the bank. This is Cablevision for you. They're too cheap to pay the $5,020 they lost in the White Plains Court, and they're too cheap to send back the $350 that the federal court made Franklin pay them to come to be witnesses. They kept the money, they put it in the bank. Well, finally, after saying a hundred times that this had happened, Bryant made him return the money. And it was a check from Callagy that paid the $350, but what about the 9% statutory interest in the state of New York for all those years? And Callagy died with this on his chest. In one word, from 1993 to 2006, from $350 to the $5,020, Callagy was cheap. And he's a Park Avenue lawyer. And he's a great First Amendment defender. And he's the model lawyer. Well, he certainly is. Insert. Peter Lane had to tell Callagy what law to use to fix the Rye City Court case against Charles Dolan and Cablevision Systems Corporation. That law was Title 47, United States Code, Section 538. It did not even apply. But Lane got in touch with Callagy and told Callagy to submit that law as an argument. to dismiss Lindor's lawsuit in the Rye City Court. It was a hoax that exuded unresisted self-surrender to vice by both Callagy and Peter Lane City Court, City of Rye. Presently, both are paying painfully for the same. Callagy's machinations sucked his life into small claims. He was in small claims Rye, I took him to small claims Harrison, I took him to small claims Phillipstown, I took him to small claims White Plains, I took him to small claims Yonkers. This is where he concluded his wife and his life. This is where he concluded his life. Defending not corporate giants, but minuscules like Deborah Ecock, Cecilia Masterilli. Christine Savarino. So we have said, a Brogdonavian in Lilliputia, he made such a fool of himself. Here lies Robert Callagy. He lies about the law, he lied about the facts. He thought it was cute to call Glendora, quote, a professional pro se, unquote. Well, I called him a an unprofessional lawyer. You obit hacks turned your backs on everything in journalism 101. Utter laxity and abandonment of restraint. But you have been caught. They have been caught, folks. In front of you, they have been caught. Your platitudes, Bruce Golding and Gannett newspapers, are patently paid political announcements. 
You, Bruce Goldberg, Golding rather, you, Bruce Golding, the hero of helping Glendora defrock John P. de Blasi and his psychotic law clerk, Shorsky, cast down rank, office, and estimation, debasing and degrading your own person with open and shameless disregard of decency. You and your hackneyed colleagues write only what the big corporations command you write, and never the truth. They forbid you write the truth. Like Caligi, you are another liar for hire. You are insensible to reproof. You are a soul, soul, soul. Your self-possession destroyed. You depart clandestinely with the truth, but you were caught on www.chatwithglendora.com and www.youtube.com slash a chat with Glendora, one word. And you were caught on 53 TV stations. You and Mitch Broding, or Brody, are rubber stamps of utter laxity of morals. Like Robert M. Kelly. You do exactly what international bankers Rothschild, and I read, I just listed them to you, want you to do. Glendora is bringing Sadly to trial. The date has been set. The gravamen is their ignorance of the law, they're lying, they're cheating. They're grubbling for $5,000. They're malfeasance, they're nonfeasance. They're bad faith. Callaghy, in his last one and a half years, caused a default judgment. Now how is that for a model lawyer? Quote, unquote. He lost big time, too. Quote, professional pro se, unquote. Alas, poor York, here lies Robert Kelly. Kelly never declared anything under penalty of perjury. He knew he was lying. He never declared he was telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help him God. He was indeed the model lawyer. Everything Callagy wrote was hearsay. He was not there when it happened. He was blister. He showed up after the work was done. Gannett's total failure to acknowledging the jet aerosol chemtrails of poisons in the sky is gossamer. It is odious, it is disgusting, abhorrent, and is disregard of your raison d'etre, your reason for being, is to tell the truth to people. But you will not touch the truth about the chemtrails, the poison in the sky, the ethylene dibroma, the barium, the aluminum. Folks, that your children are breathing. You cover up for the international bankers, and it is gossamer. The next is reserved. I'll show you, reserved. And there's the page for it. Under penalty of perjury, Glendora asseverates with alacrity that she had told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help her God. For grace to trust 
and always has on these matters. Robert M. Callaghan never has. It was dated December the 26, 2006, Anno Domini, State of New York. County of Columbia. Yours in truth, and I'm more patriae, love of one's country, and I'm more New Yorkai, love of New York. Without prejudice, uniform commercial code, Article 1, Section 207. Glendora, a chat with Glendora on 53 TV stations and 530 municipalities, including Washington, D.C., and the nation's capital in uh, New York State, capital of Albany. Lead people to be perfect, stop cruelty to animals, stop the injustice in the courts, and sue judges when they break the law. And we close with this prayer. First of all, this is a copy of the obituary, as so-called, as it appeared in the New York Law Journal, Another Liar for Hire. And the hymn that we close with, or the prayer, is Abide With Me. Well, we started this at 9 o'clock, I believe, or 10 o'clock, was it? And I think it was 11.20. Yeah, that's about right. It took an hour of mini DV. What's your joy for 11.15? How about your life? You're alive. How about for 11 o'clock, a new year? How about for 1045, the goodness in the world that always wins? How about 1030, this beautiful earth that God gives you free? Do you realize that you spend money on the bad stuff and the good stuff is free? 1015. How about colors? God is so great for colors. That's the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can detect. And how about for 10 o'clock, the rejoice that we've been given such great detectors? Can you imagine that? We have eyes that can detect the slightest change in frequency and wavelength. So we caught up with all of our rejoices for every 15 minutes. And now we'll close the Caligi obituary with this hymn to him, similar to all the other hymns I have sent in legal papers and to courts and to judges and to Caligi. Abide with me. Fast falls the evening tide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, Help of the helpless Lord, abide with me.
depending on the promises of God. Now, folks, I want you to have the joy. of Jack and Margie Flynn, who are champions of the Constitution, and who stand up boldly to judges who are not. And most of the judges today, in fact, all that I've ever met, well, wait a second, a few exceptions, a few reservations, are not champions of the Constitution. And I want you to see, uh, their telephone number. And I want you to know them. They are both Easterners who have landed up in Las Vegas. <laughs> no, don't say that. They ran out of money and couldn't get out. No. But I want you to hear what they have to say. First point. Uh, citizens of the American Constitution, that's their name, and their website is www.citizensoftheamericanconstitution.org, all one word. Citizens of the American Constitution challenges unconstitutional, unlawful, and unauthorized government. How do you like that? An unconstitutional court. No. They use constitutional based procedures. Isn't there something wrong with that, courts? Have you ever heard of that? More specifically, outlined in the case, I would think it would be Metri, it's spelled M-E-T-R-I-S, okay, Metris versus Edwards. The challenges are done in three different successive methods and let us listen. Government, the courts, and corporate America have proven and established and demonstrated their actions not to serve the interests of the people and not to serve constitutional requirements. This is Jack and Margie Flynn. And this is done to serve their own interests at a vast cost to you. They're rich, but where's the money really coming from? It's coming from you. Oaths mean little. If anything, to public officers. These public officers perjure their oaths at will. Our enemies will not abide by the Constitution. And they will not abide by lawful requirements until we, the people, require it. So start requiring it. I will read you parts of this on a chat with Glendora from time to time. As constitutionalists, Marge and Jack Flynn, do not consider constitutional oaths taken by public servants to be formalities. But 
They are a sacred bond given to exchange for the public trust. You're the public. You have trusted these people. We fully expect that all those taken by public servants in the federal and state constitu uh, constitutions, we fully expect that be, these be abided by those public servants in their performances of their official duty. We expect that. We demand that. Stop being a patsy. Go out there and demand that. You have them. The challenges are intended for this purpose. The challenges are intended for the rights of the American people. And these rights are to be upheld by those governments and those courts. Those governments and those courts sworn to serve the people. The methods follow. When we meet again, I'll read you some of those methods. Things that you can do to make sure that these punks who take an oath adhere to it. Here's some jokes. Little girl wrote on her school paper that toadstools grow in damp places. And that is why they are shaped like umbrellas. Give an example of out of bounds, the teacher said. Out of bounds. The boy said, out of bounds. An exhausted kangaroo. What is an octopus, the teacher asked. Student, an eight-sided cat. Daddy, can I join the army? Of course not. You're only an infant. I could join the infantry. Mommy, you remember that vase that's been handed down from generation to generation? Yes, Mommy said. Well, this generation just dropped it. Bill's wife calls the stew that Bill makes. He makes a stew. He, she calls it his enthusiasms do. He puts everything he has into it. The little girl says to the priest, this catechism is too hard. What I need is a kitty-kism. Mommy, am I made of sage and parsley and breadcrumbs? Oh, what gave you that idea? Billy said he was going to beat the stuffing out of me. Johnny, are you all packed for vacation? Yep. Are you sure? Yep. Did you put in your soap? Soap? You said this was a vacation. Would you like to see, the grandmother said to the little grandchild, would you like to see the cuckoo come out of the cuckoo clock? Yes, please. And I'd like to see grandfather come out of the grandfather clock. Charlie says that his little brother's only a year and a half old, and yet he's been walking for nine months. And Charlie's little buddy said, walking for nine months? He must be pretty tired. Pauline said when she was a young girl, she had plenty of men at her feet and her husband's chest. They were all podiatrists. Is that your brother? Yeah. He's kind of small, isn't he? Well, that's because he's my half-brother. 
Mommy, is it true that we come from dust and we return to dust? Yes. Then how come when I go swimming, I don't get muddy? That's a very nice picture you drew of the nativity. There's baby Jesus, there's Joseph, and there's Mary. What's this little box down here in the corner? Oh, that's their TV set. This is Glendora Cheerful Look at Life, brought to you by nobody. We're going through your portfolio here, things you haven't been reported to for a long time. This is a very nice letter from Mary Romage. She's a good writer. And she says, I'm very sorry that Celia put, took your program off the air. I was looking for the program uh, while I was crocheting. Uh, a white blanket and a baby set and I don't know how she does it. She comes up with the most beautiful pieces and how does she do it? She does it just with her fingers tying string. I think it's so wonderful. She says she's so sorry because it's the cat she looks at. That's dot com. She always wants to know what dot com is doing. Dot com right now is on the stack, Mary, of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight boxes. She's on the top of that. Love, Mary. This is the picture of my pastor, the Reverend Nathan Meldrum, and little Andrew and wife Kristen. I want to say hello to Bill Braley in Washington, D.C. Uh, he's a good fan, and he appreciates the information that comes from a chat with Glendora, how America has been robbed by a bunch of gangsters. Uh, robbed. You robbed of it. I'd like to say hello to Drew, who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, and was in DC TV and saw a chat with Glendora. And he and others are touring the country in a play a musical called Aida. And they call me up from Syracuse, and they call me up from Pennsylvania. And I think that's very, very interesting. So hello to two DC TV fans, Drew and Drew Simpson and uh, Bill Braley. I forgot to tell you, And I don't know how I did that, because it certainly is an important point, that Robert Callaghan cost Glendora, well, actually it's Franklin, uh, $42,000, print, post, travel, court fees, stenographer's fees, which is not, not robbery, uh, over 3,000 hours, uh, 28,000 pages of setting the lie straight, setting the record straight. 96 volumes and 18 file drawers. And that we have a record of over 3,000 lies by Robert Callaghan. Cablevision, Charles Dolan, James Dolan, 
and all the hoods they hired to lie for them. And that, the fight with Cablevision has gone on, or standing up for public access rights, keeping Cablevision from stealing public access rights. This fight has gone on for 13 years. It started on Armistice Day, or Veterans Day, of the year 1993. And this is the year 2006. So actually it's 13 years and two months. And there have been something like 300 mailings. holding you with the unseen hand. And I hope that that happens to you. Partnership day for me was Valentine's Day on February 